and original. From Story Studio Network. I'm Aaron Trafford in Halifax. I'm Dave Trafford in Toronto. And this is Now and Next. This week, Now and Next brings you a special Remembrance Week series. Brought to you by the RCAF Foundation. As we approach Remembrance Day, November 11th, here in Canada, we're called upon to acknowledge and honor the years of service our veterans have afforded this country and the sacrifices they made, often with their lives. But it's also an opportunity to celebrate the rich history of this country that has informed and shaped our culture, our national identity, and our place in the world. I'm Dave Trafford. I'm Aaron Trafford. In this limited podcast series, we endeavor to explore some of the stories that are uniquely rooted in the history of the Royal Canadian Air Force and Canadian Aviation. Welcome to Pathway to the Stars. You know, the more we keep digging into the history of uh, Canadian aviation, the history of the RCAF, the more I realize just how small this world was a uh, 100 years ago. And a lot of that early history, RCAF aviation history, played out here in Toronto. And we've now learned the name William Barker. Yeah, he's the first president of the Toronto Maple Leafs. And the most decorated serviceman in the history of the Commonwealth. I mean, he put like, come on, in the Commonwealth. I mean, that's he's a serious guy. He was the first director of the RCAF in 1924. And also best friend to Billy Bishop. Okay, so after all that, I also learned that Bishop was married to Timothy Eaton's granddaughter, and he appeared as himself in a Hollywood movie. It was called Captains of the Clouds. And Bishop and Barker were also partners in one of Canada's first ever chartered airline services. And it was based somewhere in a neighborhood in Toronto, correct? Yeah. And today it's a nice leafy green neighborhood in Toronto. And that's where we begin this episode of Pathway to the Stars. Okay, here we are. It's 1838. Four years since the city of Toronto was incorporated, 29 years before Confederation. Canada's not a country yet. And a farmer named John Armour purchases a piece of land from James Hogg. Now, you will know Hogg's Hollow if you are anywhere near Toronto, located York Mills and Young. So the piece of property that Armour buys is located north of what is now Wilson Avenue. It's just west of Young Street. Stretches all the way over to Bathurst to the west and almost reaches Shepherd to the north. And today, I think I have my math right. There's 12 lanes of 401 highway that cuts straight through the middle of that path. Pretty much. Not quite the, the, the meadow that uh, John Armour would have paced back in 1838. Otherwise, right now, it's an upper middle class suburban neighborhood known as Armour Heights, named after Farmer John. Okay, so why are we here again? Well, Armour Heights was the site of one of six airfields where pilots were trained to support the British in the First World War. And I put the emphasis on field in airfield. First of all, it would be an airfield, not an airport. Rick Gillespie heads up the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery. He's in Oxford, Pennsylvania, and he told me, There may have been, you know, a few hangars on site, but not the kind of infrastructure we'd think of today. It would not have runways. It would be a big, open field. No runways, no buildings, meant a whole lot more flexibility for pilots. They could take advantage of prevailing wind conditions. You can just see what way the wind's blowing, turn your airplane that way, and take off in that direction. So you're never faced with the difficulties of a crosswind landing. Now, the aircraft of the day weren't really robust enough to manage any kind of crosswind. The airplanes there would have a wooden framework covered with usually Irish linen, really tough stuff, with a coating of dope that would seal the 
the fabric. So you got to keep in mind that these things, the planes, were actually were made of wood and Irish linen. Not much to them. <laughs> Wait, wood and Irish linen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was tough. The linen was tough. And then they covered it with this dope. It's kind of like a souped up batch of nail polish. Okay. And they covered the linen with the dope and it would toughen and harden the shell and keep it light. So like who in their right mind is getting into one of those things and then hoping that it actually takes off and gets off the ground? Like, really? You'd be shocked to know that there were about 150 flyers who graduated from the Curtis Flying School in Toronto. Now, this is before Armour Heights became a training site for the RAF. I spoke to Ken Swartz. He's a member of the Canadian Aviation Historical Society. In the early days, these wannabe pilots had to put up their own cash to be trained. Pilots paid their own tuition. They came from all across Canada to Toronto to train. And uh, many of them, or most of them graduated and went overseas to fight. And some died. Whoa, so that gives you an entirely new sense of duty and service. These men were willing to pay tuition to fly, fight, possibly die in the service of country and king. Yeah, and I don't even know if you'd call the training intense that they had, but it was certainly condensed. Typically what would happen is they would go through the school and then once they achieved a certain level of qualification, they would be put on a train and a boat and uh, carry on to England to perhaps get more operational training. Training only began here, and then it was completed in Britain, so the pilots could actually get some time in a real fighter plane. But all in, this training took less than a month. (laughs) A few weeks. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, uh, they, they just ran them through. The question is, did the training here prepare someone for combat? The loss rates were still quite high. Both Rick Gillespie and Ken Swartz told me we can't overstate the urgency to train pilots back in the First World War. Now, you got to remember, war is raging in Europe. Britain's air combat loss rates are incredibly high. Now, to complicate things further, the training fields were statistically more dangerous than the battlefield. And this is this is true up through World War II. There were... More fatalities in training than there were in combat. More pilots and planes were lost in training than in combat with the enemy. Nobody's cheering for a war, but this story does make it pretty clear the needs of that war machine pushed the aviation industry to grow at a rapid and accelerated rate. I mean, just think of the advancements from the biplane in the First World War to the British Spitfire in the Second World War, to the supersonic Avro Arrow that was built in Brampton, Ontario at the beginning of the Cold War. The Arrow One, Canada's first supersonic fighter plane, is ready to fly after five years of work and planning by 5,000 people at Avro of Canada near Toronto. That is an explosion of innovation and new technology in a very short 40-year period. Yeah, well, and and we're going to get into the Avro story in another episode. But let's just dial it back again. Rudimentary as those aircraft were, this was cutting-edge technology, right? In fact, Rick tells me newspapers in the day had dedicated aviation sections. Just like you'd have a sports section today that reported on the latest developments. We rarely see something like that. We take it all for granted so much. If you're enjoying this podcast and you want to learn more about our Canadian aviation history, visit the RCAF Foundation website. It's rcaffoundation.ca. And while you're there, well, you just might want to donate to the RCAF Foundation scholarships offered to Canada's next generation of aviation and aerospace leaders. So Armour Heights, along with the other Canadian training fields, play a crucial role in the war effort. Also happens to be the place that made aviation history of another kind, though. 
It is a really surprising kind of story. Chantal Gagnon is the Director of Branding and Digital Media at Historica Canada, and she's almost giddy when she tells us about an unlikely turn of events that leads to a surprising story. It's the story of a young woman from Philadelphia who finds herself in Toronto at the height of the war. The reason that she found herself in Toronto was more happenstance than anything else. Now, she's in the city to visit her sister. Her younger sister was actually studying at a teacher's college in Toronto. During her short stay, she was affected by the sight of the number of wounded men returning home from the war. This was 1917, so right about the same time the United States had entered the First World War. So she may not have been seeing the same number of war wounded when she was back in Philadelphia at the time. When she returned home to Philadelphia, she only lasted there a couple weeks before coming back and wanting to find a way to, to help the men that she saw coming back to the city. The real twist of fate happens, though, after she goes back to Philly. For whatever reason, she decided to return to Toronto and volunteer as a nurse's assistant. She did end up coming back to the city to volunteer as a, as a nurse's assistant, and she worked at the Spadina Military Convalescent Hospital. It's worth noting she came by her nursing interest in Judy's naturally. Her plan was to actually study medicine. Before she came back to Toronto, she was actually aiming to study pre-med um, at a university in Philadelphia. So it was very much in keeping with her interests. Needless to say, her work would have been intense, extremely emotional. So her connection with the military would have been fairly deep. So much so, she makes it a point of paying a visit to the training fields in Toronto. She basically had the occasional Sunday off from the work she was doing um, at the hospital. And on one of those Sundays off, she went to visit some former patients of hers at Armour Heights, um, who were now doing training exercises and putting on flight shows for the public to, to watch. So she went there and she herself said that in Toronto is where this bug for flying that would eventually become the consuming passion of her life um, started. And then she's bitten by the aviation bug. She's not allowed to fly in the training aircraft. There's only room for the pilot. And besides, that wouldn't have been a thing for a lady to do in those days. Nonetheless, a combination of fascination and excitement at Armour Heights set her on an historic course. She very much saw that as the moment where she realized how much she wanted to to fly. It's a great story. And it all happened in Toronto. Okay. Would be a better story, you know, if you told me who she was. Who do you think you are? Paul Harvey? We need the rest of the story. Okay, I will, I will. But before I do, you need to know the beginning and the end of her historic career. Our book ended in Toronto. Mm -hmm. On a Sunday in 1918, a 21-year-old nursing assistant spent her day off visiting the Armour Heights airfield to watch an air show exhibition. And so began Amelia Earhart's journey into aviation. Wow. Now you know the rest of the story. Every time, you know, we open a book like this on this story... <laughs> The next page is something of a surprise. So you can see how Chantal <laughs> Gagnon gets gets excited about telling uh, her story. All right, that's the front end. What's the final bookend? Okay, so the final bookend comes 1937. Earhart and her navigator, who was Fred Noonan, set out to fly 29,000 miles around the world. the world ladybird and her crew ready for an adventure that nobody has ever tried before amelia Earhart out to circle the earth at the latitude of the equator and that's the earth they had 7000 miles to go when they left new guinea and they were heading for howland island on the morning of july the 2nd 
they were never seen again. But they were heard. A woman living on Ashdale Avenue in Toronto was a ham radio operator. As historian Jason Wilson told us, Gertrude Crabb is monitoring her powerful 22 radio and hears a barely distinguishable message amid the crackling static. I was fascinated by this idea that you have a housewife, a ham radio operator who lives on Ashdale Avenue in Toronto, Gertrude Crabb, who, who's fiddling around with, with her radio in, in July of 1937 and comes across, legitimately comes across, Amelia Earhart's last words that were covered on radio. Um, Hold on to this line, do you think they got our SOS? And that was it. That was all she heard. And it was, it took several years to actually, you know, uh, hammer the uh, the details out. But I believe there was, uh, there was a young teenager in Florida and there was someone else in Europe and they all heard the same thing at the same time. And, and it was almost certainly uh, Amelia Earhart's voice um, coming from, from her, her call sign, KJQQ. Are you all right? Hold on to this line. Do you think they got our SOS? After that, no sign of Earhart or Noonan. They disappeared on their way to Howland Island. You know, the, uh, the mystery and the mythology that's developed around Earhart fills journals, libraries, movies, documentaries, and, and plenty of it is tinged with conspiracy theories. There's a whole question as to whether or not she survived, for some reason was hidden and took on a new identity. But no matter the unresolved story, you can't really deny that Earhart inspired legions of young women. Now, it's not clear who she met at Armour Heights training field, but I'd like to think she might have crossed paths with John Gillespie McGee Jr. He was a young Canadian who, as soon as the war broke out, he joined the RCAF and ended up in England flying uh, with the RAF. Rick Gillespie says Pilot McGee was a poet, and he managed to articulate the real magic of flying more than a century ago. I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the sky on laughter-silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling worth of sun-split clouds and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of wheeled and soared and swung. High in the sunlit silence, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace where never lark nor even eagle flew. And while, with silent, lifting mind, I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touch the face of God. This now and next series, Pathway to the Stars, is produced for the RCAF Foundation by Story Studio Network. And we'd encourage you to go over to their website, check them out, rcaffoundation.ca. And while you're there, you may want to consider donating to the RCAF Foundation scholarships offered to Canada's next generation of aviation and aerospace leaders like Ryan Courchid. It is my goal to show children of new immigrants, especially those from a war-torn background, that they can achieve just as much, if not more, than their counterparts. In doing so, I also hope to break down some of the barriers and gatekeeping that currently exist that prevent outsiders from pursuing aviation as a career. Beyond my cultural community, I would also like to contribute as a free online tutor and instructor for all things aviation related. In this ever-increasing independence on online learning, I owe a lot of credit of my current academic success to online resources that publish relevant content for free on YouTube and other websites. 
Paying for expensive, well-made ground school courses is just not feasible for some people, including myself, and presents an additional barrier from succeeding in the industry. I am looking to create my own page and channel to produce high-quality videos and tutoring guidance on aviation-related subjects, without the heavy price tag that most courses require. Your money helps with those ambitions and those dreams. Again, go to rcffoundation.ca and make a donation today. Now and Next is produced by Becky Coles. Our production manager is Jamie Nickerson. Our audio editors are Mike Trutler and Drew Garner. Our sonic logo designer is Greg McDonald. And our executive producers are me, Dave Trafford, and Aaron Trafford. Thanks for listening. This is SSN. Story Studio Network.